morning, it's February 18th, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, today featuring Dean L. Song Richardson of UC Irvine School of Law. We're looking forward to a tremendous presentation from Dean Richardson, and uh, want to remind everybody this is part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan last spring. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank of their choice or one suggested by our speaker if they're in a position to do so. One of my favorite parts of the webinar each week is to talk to my co-host, Gene Lawler, and ask Gene to let us know what the running total is so far, how much our very generous audiences have contributed to food banks since the uh, New Possibilities Hour and the Will Work for Food Project began last spring. Jean, I think you have some good news for us. I do, Jeff, and thank you for everybody. And you can see the big smile on Natalie's face. Uh, we've gone over the $80,000 mark, $80,016, 80016. And that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. And that's just what Natalie knows about. I'm sure there have been other donations maybe that she doesn't know about. So uh, thank you. Your donations, however small or large, near or far, whatever food bank it might be, is fantastic, thank you. Yes, thanks to everyone. The audiences, the community that we have here in the Will Work for Food Project is just awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for your generosity. And now let's talk about uh, introducing our guest for today, L. Song Richardson, longtime friend, the Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law, with joint appointments in the Department of Criminology, the Department of uh, Criminology, Law and Society, and in the Department of Asian American Studies. She received her AB from Harvard College and her JD from Yale Law School. On July 1st, uh, 2021, Dean Richardson will become the 14th president of Colorado College. Her interdisciplinary research uses lessons from cognitive and social psychology to study decision-making and judgment in a variety of contexts. Her scholarship has been published by law journals at Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Duke, and Northwestern, among others. Dean Richardson is a leading expert on the impact of implicit racial and gender biases in a variety of contexts, including emerging technologies, and is frequently invited to speak to law firms, private industry, uh, judges, and bar associations across the nation on these issues. Dean Richardson, Song, I've heard you speak on related topics before, and I know that your messages are always educational and sensitizing, and always in a way that, that unites and I dare say uplifts us. So with that, the floor is yours. Please tell us a bit about Second Harvest Food Bank, which is where you would like people to direct contributions if they're in a position to do so. Tell us a bit about Second Harvest and then take it away. As I said, Wonderful. the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been such a pleasure um, uh, working with you uh, and, and, and getting to know you uh, during my time here. And I also wanna thank all of you for being here. Thank you, uh, Jean and Natalie for this kind invitation. Um, and I'm so honored to be here, uh, especially given the incredible generosity uh, of this community. I am truly, truly blown away by it. Uh, Second Harvest Food Bank is my um, preferred food bank. It's our local food bank. I've been there and volunteered there, as have many members of the UCI law um, community. They do amazing work for our community. So if you don't have your own food bank of choice, thank you so much for donating to Second Harvest. And uh, again, uh, thank you, Jeff. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I will now share my screen, hopefully. Everyone can see that. Can you see this? Can everyone see my PowerPoint? It, no, it's, not yet. It's, oh, yes, not yet. You have started screen sharing. Hmm, I'll try that again. Okay, here we go. Yes, there it is. Oh, good. 
Okay, because it's showing it on my end. All right. So today I want to talk with you about implicit bias and racial anxiety. And I'll describe some of these um, uh, studies on implicit bias and racial anxiety, talk about how it impacts our lives, and talk about ways in which we can safeguard ourselves from acting on them. And the reason I like talking about unconscious or implicit racial bias is it is something that I, as a Black Korean woman, was surprised over a decade ago to realize that I had. And when I talk more about it, you'll see why I was surprised that I had unconscious racial and gender biases. Um, and when I found out that I did, I had to do a deep dive myself to understand how it could be that someone who is a person of color, who is or identifies as female, and who is a civil rights lawyer um, throughout my entire career could have unconscious biases that impacted my behaviors, my decisions, my judgments in ways um, that I found deeply problematic. And so I had to learn how could it be uh, that I would have them and that others would. And so I had to do a deep dive into understanding the way that our minds work, the way that our brains work and how we make decisions. So I wanna share some of that knowledge with you. So I will be asking all of you to participate. You don't need to unmute yourself. You can just raise your hands uh, with some of the questions I'm gonna ask you here. So taking a look at this slide, raise your hand if you see triangles. I see some of you raising your hand. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature. <laughs> Even better. Uh, okay. How about if you see the Star of David? And some of you may see Pac-Man. I mentioned Pac-Man because my students now are so young that some of them don't even know what Pac-Man is, which is a shock to me. So Pac-Man right here actually exists on this slide, but there are no triangles on this slide and the Star of David doesn't exist either. And yet, if you see those shapes, and most people do, it tells you something about the way that your brains work and you want your brains to work this way. So unconsciously, automatically, and by automatic, I mean you have no control over it. So unconsciously, quickly, and automatically, your brains fill in missing pieces. So because you know what a triangle looks like, and if you know what the Star of David looks like, your brain will automatically fill it in, those lines, without you thinking about it. Why? Because it is learned to do a lot in the background beyond your conscious awareness so that you can pay attention to the things that matter in the moment. So I'm sure many of you are sitting in a chair and I'm sure if you are, that very few of you, if any, thought about the strange object that you're sitting on because your brain has learned to associate things that look like your chair as something that you sit on. Same thing if you're using a fork or chopsticks, right? You don't give any mental energy to that because your brain has learned what those objects are and what you do with them. And as you'll learn in a bit, our brains do the identical thing when it comes to people. So I'm gonna ask you to participate again. And this time, when you look at these slides, I will ask you to say the color but ignore the word. In other words, don't read. So as quickly as possible while avoiding mistakes, I want you to say the color out loud, even if you have to whisper it, say the color out loud, but don't read. So I'll do the first one with you, okay? As fast as possible while avoiding mistakes. Ready, go. Red, yellow, blue, green, brown. I hope you're doing this with me because <laughs> It'll have an impact only if you say it out loud. Okay, let's do the next one. Don't read. Blue, brown, red, yellow, green. We're going to do it again. This time, just the color, not the word. Red, yellow, blue, green, brown. Blue, brown, red, yellow, green. Blue, brown, okay. red, yellow, green. Perfect. Now, one more time, as fast as possible, avoiding mistakes. Don't read. 
Now, if you were doing this out loud, what you will have found is that, and I see some of you are doing it and some of you aren't, <laughs> but if you did do it, what you will have found is that this was harder, right? Your reaction Blue, time. brown, red, green, yellow. <laughs> oh, that was good, yes. So what you would have found though, is that this one was harder for you. And the reason for that, and social psychologists would say, your response time was slower. And the reason for that is I asked you to do something unfair. And what this describes or what you will feel is that you don't have full control over everything that your mind does. And this is an example of it because I asked you not to read. And you cannot stop yourself from reading in a language that you know how to read. It is impossible. So if I had done these slides in a language that you couldn't read, there would have been no difference in your reaction time. But again, you have little control sometimes over what your brains are doing and you read in a language uh, that you understand. That's why your reaction time was slower. So that's an example, just like with the first slide of the triangles and the circles, it's an example of how little control we often have over what is happening in our unconscious and yet it can impact our behaviors, our judgments and our decisions. So I mentioned this book, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and social psychologist. He wrote this book. I think every lawyer uh, should get this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. What he talks about in this book is the same thing that I'm gonna be talking with you about. So it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. He talks about system one and system two. System one is where I'm going to focus most of my talk this morning, and that is on the things that occur unconsciously. System one is the way our brains work. It is unconscious, it's automatic, and it affects us in ways that we are unaware of because it is unconscious. System two is what we often identify with when we think about making decisions, right? It is conscious. We, we think hard. It takes effort. Um, that's often what we think of when we think about our brains. What we don't under realize is that system one, our unconscious thinking affects system two. And although Daniel Kahneman does not write about unconscious racial and gender biases, and I'll give you ex an example that's useful for lawyers and mediators um, in a moment, even though he doesn't write about race, it is the identical science. So anchoring is one of the concepts that he writes about. Many of you may have heard about anchoring. So what is anchoring? It is an unconscious automatic process. And the way it works is if I give you an arbitrary made up number, your brain will unconsciously anchor on that number and then it'll impact future numeric judgments. So for instance, I grew up in a small town called Shirley, Massachusetts. I'm sure almost none of you <laughs> or none of you have heard of Shirley, Massachusetts. So if I were to ask you, what is the population of Shirley, Massachusetts? Is it a million? Just by saying a million, and if you don't actually know the population, that million dollar number, which is completely arbitrary, would impact the judgment of Shirley, Massachusetts population versus if I had said 5 million. So let me give you an example uh, involving judges. So judges read a fact pattern uh, about a woman who suffered uh, mental anguish was her claim. And the judges were asked, what is the award that you would give to this plaintiff? When the judges received no information, no monetary information at all, you can see what their median award was. It was around $6,000. But then they were given, another group of judges were given random arbitrary information. And this was the information they were given. That the plaintiff had watched a television show. Uh, and the plaintiff in the television show had the same identical situation as hers. And that jury in that television show granted the plaintiff $415,000, completely irrelevant from a TV show. And when you ask the judges, would this number impact the award that you would give? They all said no, right? It's completely irrelevant. And yet for the judges who received this anchor, their median award went up to $50,000 from 60, from $6,000. 
Anchoring is something that happens and has been demonstrated over and over and over again in studies. It's partly why this discovery of the way that our brains work is why Daniel Kahneman in his book won a Nobel Prize. All right, so I'm now going to talk about unconscious uh, associations, the ones that we make about race and gender. Everything that I'm going to share with you today is based on studies that social psychologists have done. And because I'm relying on studies, most of what I will talk about is the biases that we have related to white individuals and black individuals, because that is the focus of much of the studies. Uh, to skip to the end for a moment, the unconscious biases, the unconscious associations that our brains make when millions of people are tested on the implicit association test, for instance, that I'll talk to you about in a moment. What it shows is that most of us, regardless of our race, unconsciously associate black individuals with negative things and white individuals with positive things, women with the home and men with the workplace. And I'll discuss why our brains learn it and why our unconscious biases so often conflict with what we consciously think. But part of how our brains learn is through constant associations. So why do we make the associations that I just discussed with you? Our history, right? Our culture. I'm not gonna go into any great detail about that because I don't have enough time today, uh, but our history and culture are certainly the primary reasons our brain learned these unconscious associations. But we also learn them just from our family, our friends, even children as young as five years old have the unconscious biases I just discussed with you. People often ask me why, and they can learn them from watching cartoons. So let me describe a bit using artificial intelligence how our brains develop unconscious associations because it basically works the same way. So for those of you who are familiar with these AI systems, you know that the way you teach these systems to learn is by providing these systems with data. So there was one AI system that they wanted to teach to understand the English language. And the way that they do that is they feed it data and the data it, the researchers and technologists chose was all of Google News for a particular period of time. They didn't remove anything, they didn't add anything, it was just all of Google News. They input it into the system. The system builds an algorithm based on the information that it receives and it began to understand the English language. But then, and so it's the way our brains work, right? You just take in a bunch of information and your brain starts to make associations. So then the researchers decided to do something unusual and they decided to give this um, system something called the implicit association test. It's one of the ways that we can try to uncover what is going on in our own unconscious minds. So they gave the unconscious association, the implicit association test to this system. And what did they find? That the system, simply from the data it learned from Google News, develop the same unconscious biases humans have. More negative associations with black individuals, more positive associations with whites. Women belong at home, men belong at work, right? These are the associations that the AI system learned from reading the news. So if the AI system learns these things from reading Google News, of course our brains do too. Two other examples about the way we develop these unconscious biases. If you use your iPhone and Siri the way that I do all the time, what you know is that the default voice is female. And what do we use Siri for? To assist us, right? To make appointments for us, to remind us of things. And so our brain is making the association of female with assistant versus the Watson computer. Uh, the Watson computer, as you may know, won Jeopardy. And that pre-programmed voice, which could have been female, wasn't, right? It was, it was uh, a male voice. And so what is our brain, again, learning through the association of maleness with intelligence is that men are intelligent. This is how we develop these unconscious associations, right? We practice these associations just by living our lives. The more you practice an association, it becomes unconscious. And then it's activated even when you're unaware that it's being activated and it impacts you.
So again, this is a magazine uh, from a Delta flight I took and my brain just from looking at it is learning men are leaders. And I don't have to be aware of what my brain is learning. It just happens. You want your brains to work this way. So I'll give you an example of implicit bias and its impact um, with a study involving orchestras. So there were orchestras that were having difficulty hiring female musicians. And when they were asked why, many of the conductors and managers said, well, we're trying, but we just can't find female musicians that are as talented as the male musicians are. Some of the managers and conductors of major symphonies across the country said that can't be right. And so what they did is they worked with researchers and they had people audition behind a screen. Now, when you think about the impact that our unconscious biases have, it's important to remember that they impact us primarily in situations that are ambiguous, where we don't have full information. And so what our minds do is it just fills in the missing pieces the way it did uh, with the triangles and the Star of David that I started out with today. And so when it comes to music, if you're incredibly talented like Yo-Yo Ma, right, on the one hand, or if you're just learning the violin on the other, which doesn't sound great at all, right? Your unconscious biases are unlikely to impact you. But in that middle, it turns out that the way that we hear music is ambiguous and impacted by unconscious bias. Because when musicians auditioned behind the screen, the number of female musicians went up by 25 to 46%. And then some symphonies, like the one here in Orange County, the Pacific Symphony, they go a step further and they put a carpet um, on the stage or they have people take off their shoes. Why? Because the click, click, click of heels across the stage make our brains think female and then it impacts how we hear the music. So when you took off your shoes or walked across the carpet, the number of female musicians hired went up by another 10%. So these unconscious biases are linked to everything you can possibly imagine. I just give a few examples here. And how does it actually work? So just like with the chair, when your brain sees something that looks like a chair, it activates unconsciously um, things that look like a chair. So we categorize everything. That's how you know what to do with the chair. You do the same thing with people. So when you see someone, like when you first saw me, your brain unconsciously, within milliseconds actually, is placing me into a racial and gender category. And within milliseconds, your brain places people, it doesn't matter if it's the right category or not, your unconscious brain makes a quick decision and places everyone into a racial category first, a gender category second, and then a whole host of other characteristics. Once you have placed someone in a category, then quickly, unconsciously, automatically, your brain starts to apply what it has learned about that racial category and gender category and how it feels about that gender or racial category. Again, this happens very quickly. And these stereotypes and attitudes, you don't have to consciously believe them, right? That's an important point. It is what your unconscious brain is learned simply by taking in information every day. So we call it implicit. That just means you cannot control it, right? It is automatic, just like when you can't stop yourself from reading in a language you know how to read. And then we call it bias. And often when we think about bias, we think about negative bias. But bias works both ways. It can result in negative treatment of particular groups and more positive treatment of other groups, which is why bias can result in disparities because of negative and or positive treatment. And finally, these associations that our brains make strengthen over time. The more they're activated, the stronger they become, right? Just like you know what to do with a chair. It is a very strong association because we practice it unconsciously all the time. This is also why, this is the point I started with at the beginning, I was a civil rights lawyer, I already told you my race, my gender, my self-concept is I am one of the most consciously egalitarian people that I know. <laughs> That's my own self-concept. And yet, when I took the implicit association test, which I'll describe uh, to you now, 
what it demonstrated is, despite the fact that I'm Black, I had more negative associations with Black individuals versus white individuals. Despite the fact that I identify as female, I was more likely to associate females with the home and men with leadership, right? So the implicit association test, if you have not taken it, it is one measure, one way uh, to at least check and see, do I have unconscious biases? But you have to take it more than one. So the implicit association test is not a one-off test, right? It is based on aggregate data. And the science behind the implicit association test is identical to this Stroop test is, is what it's called. The difference in your reaction time. So it tests the difference in your reaction time to see how or what your unconscious minds associate with black individuals and white individuals and all sorts of other things. Millions of people have taken the implicit association test and you can see 71% of the people, at least the last time uh, that I checked, this was in 2019, preferred white individuals over black, flowers over insects, associated women with the home and uh, had a positive, <clears throat> excuse me, more positive bias to people who were abled versus those with disabilities. I encourage you to take this. There are so many different tests that you can take. Okay, let me share some studies with you. Um, before I do though, it's important for me to also say that although I'm talking about the impact of unconscious biases, I'm not dismissing um, the very real impact of conscious, explicit racism, sexism, misogyny, bigotry, et cetera. Of course that exists. I don't care about that. I mean, I care about that. <laughs> but I don't care about talking to those people, right? I care about people like us who want to do the right thing, who are consciously egalitarian and yet might be impacted by our own unconscious biases. So here was a study involving race. They had identical resumes and all they did was change the name. Some names make our unconscious brain think white and some make our unconscious brain think black. And so what the researchers wanted to know when they sent out these resumes to actual employers was would race impact the number of callback interviews that black individuals and white individuals received. Obviously, some of the people making these decisions were racist or sexist or both. But I personally don't believe that all of them are. And so what did the results show? Those individuals with white names received about almost one and a half times more callback interviews than those individuals with black names, simply because the name on the resume was different. What about the evaluations we make of people? So this particular study involved law firms. You can see it was a diverse array of partners and they were asked to review a writing sample of an associate at a law firm who graduated from NYU. What the partners didn't know is that this was a study where there were errors embedded in the writing sample. And the only way that the partners would know the race of the individual was with the photo that was attached to the writing sample. And this was again meant to trigger unconscious bias. So what happened? When partners believed that Thomas Meyer was white, you can see that the overall score was high, right? 4.1 out of five. And you can see some of the ways that this Thomas Meyer was evaluated. A good writer has potential, good analytic skills. And they only found a little less than three spelling and grammatical errors and about four technical writing errors. Now remember, it's the identical writing sample, but this time these partners thought Thomas Meyer was black the overall score went down to 3.2 out of five. These were the evaluations instead of has potential, it's now can't believe he went to NYU average at best. And they found more spelling errors and more technical writing errors. Why? So if unconsciously, and this could work consciously too, you don't think that black individuals are as intelligent as white individuals or framed a different way, 
if unconsciously you think whites are super intelligent and blacks are just average, either way, those unconscious associations impact your behaviors, your actions, your decisions. And so you're gonna be more careful when you read the black Thomas Myers writing sample than you are the white Thomas Meyer writing sample. This was a recent study. Um, I won't go into great detail, except to say that when individuals had pictures of attorneys, either an Asian attorney or a white attorney, and they were listening to a recording of a deposition, and then they were asked, which would you hire? Which one do you think was more effective? Which one would you uh, recommend to a friend? They chose the white litigator. And remember, they use the identical recording. And another way in which our unconscious brains work is in another series of studies, when they use the, an identical recording and put pictures on it, people hear accents and broken English when the photo is of someone Asian versus white, even though the recording is identical. Here, now I'm gonna to switch to gender for a moment, if you ask people who is the leader and you show them this picture, they have no problem pointing to the gentleman sitting at the head of the table. But if you show them an almost identical photo with a female sitting at the head of the table, people have great difficulty. Gender um, uh, and resumes. This is an almost identical study to the one involving race, except the, the names now identical resumes, male or female name. And they sent it to uh, lab managers, male and female lab managers. And here's what they found with the male student, which is the yellow bar, female student, the tan bar. Both male and female lab managers who were making the hiring decisions were more likely to hire the male student, more likely to believe that the male student was competent and more likely to believe that the male student would benefit from mentoring. They also offered the male student $3,000, $4,000 more as a starting salary. Performance evaluations. There is an ongoing, actually it might not be ongoing anymore, um, study of performance evals and male and female managers more likely to describe and critique uh, women in stereotypical ways, right? So if you don't act according to the stereotype, you are critiqued for it. Women are more likely to have their accomplishments um, attributed to the team. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great to be a great team player, but so often when we're making hiring decisions or promoting people, we look at their individual efforts. So this tends to hurt females being described in stereotypical ways. And in other studies where they looked at performance evals, only women were critiqued for being ambitious. Recommendation letters. I could share with you so many studies. I'm gonna end soon to talk about what we can do. I just chose a few. Um, in this study of recommendation letters, these are the ways that male candidates are most often described and their titles are referred to far more often than female candidates in recommendation letters. The final thing I'll talk about is racial anxiety, and then um, I'll spend about 10 minutes thinking about ways we can safeguard ourselves from acting on our unconscious biases and on racial anxiety, and then I'm happy to take uh, questions. So let me talk about racial anxiety. Uh, because the behavioral effect, the way it impacts our interactions is identical to the um, impact of unconscious racial or gender bias. So racial anxiety is studied by social psychologists and this is what it refers to. It refers to the anxiety that we feel before and during an interracial interaction. So we worry before an interracial interaction and then we're worried during it. Um, and the most, um, uh, the, the typical interracial interaction that are studied here is interactions between black individuals and white individuals. So if you're a white individual and you're about to, let's say, interact with me and you don't know me, you might feel anxious. You might be worried that you will do or say something that will make me think that you're racist. So that leads to anxiety on your part. And from my part, my anxiety might be 
when I anticipate and then interact with you as a white individual, I might be worried and suffer from anxiety because I'm worried you're going to treat me differently because of my race or my gender. So what happens when two people are anxious or when anyone's anxious? Just think about a time when you were anxious, right? We make less eye contact when we're anxious. Our body language is more unfriendly. We don't know what to do with our hands and such because we, come, we become very self-conscious. And because it is uncomfortable, we tend to end the interaction early because you just wanna get out of an uncomfortable position and situation. The other thing that social psychologists find is there are uh, self-fulfilling prophecy effects, right? And what that means is um, if I see you in engaging in a type of behavior, I will mirror that behavior without even realizing it, right? Like often if I scratch my nose, you might find yourself scratching your nose. If I'm frowning or smiling, you'll, you might frown or smile. Uh, we just do this, right? It's called mirroring. So if I don't realize that because of my anxiety, my nonverbal behaviors are unfriendly. I don't realize I'm doing that. You are marrying my behaviors. And so what I'm seeing are your unfriendly behaviors, right? I'm thinking it's you. When actually we're feeding off of each other's behaviors. That's what happens with anxiety. The other thing is you might tell yourself when you're talking to me, don't ask Song if she likes kimchi, right? I mentioned kimchi, it's a pickled vegetable that Koreans eat a lot of, and you might know that. And so you might say to yourself, don't ask Song if she likes kimchi. When you tell yourself not to do something, what does your brain do? It brings that thing up to the forefront of your mind so it can suppress it. That's the way it works. Think about a diet, right? If you're on a diet, you're telling yourself, don't eat a lemon tart. You're thinking about lemon tarts all the time because your brain is bringing it up so it can suppress it. What does that mean in interactions? You are far more likely to say or do exactly the thing that you've been telling yourself not to do because that's the way that our brains work. And I share all of this with you because one of the most important ways of trying to break the negative unconscious associations that we have, or at least not to act on them, is to engage with people who are different from us. And yet, because of racial anxiety and implicit bias, our interactions can be very uncomfortable and someone might say or do something that'll make one of you think that the other is a racist, even though that might not be the case. In fact, in some of these racial anxiety studies, it is the actual bigot who could care less about what someone like me might think of him that is the most comfortable during the interaction. And so I might leave that interaction thinking, wow, this person's great, versus the consciously egalitarian person who so cares so much, is so nervous that they're the ones who blurt out or do the offensive thing. And I would be left with the wrong impression. So I share all of this because there are ways to address one's own racial anxiety and to also help us keep an open mind based on um, one-off interactions that we might have. Racial anxiety and implicit bias can have real impacts. I know many of you, if not all of you, are mediators. All of you have likely been involved in situations where you're hiring someone, where you might want to mentor someone. Racial anxiety can have impacts where you are less likely to mentor someone when you feel uncomfortable around them, even though you re really do want to help. Uh, in a study involving teachers, white teachers are less likely to give needed and necessary critical feedback to black students versus white students because of the worry that they'll be thought of as racist. So it can really, racial anxiety and implicit bias can have pernicious impacts. So unconscious bias impacts us no matter what the situation is. I just list a few, I'm sure you can come up with others. Anytime you are making a discretionary decision you have to be concerned that your actions, your decisions, your perceptions might be impacted by unconscious bias. So are we culpable for that? My answer to that is no. Because just like with the systems that exist, our brains are just learning these unconscious associations. So I don't think we're culpable for having them. We are culpable in my view, this is my personal view, for not putting systems in place 
to protect ourselves, safeguard ourselves from acting on the unconscious biases that most of us have. And just me talking with you this morning, sharing with you some of these studies is creating unconscious associations in your minds, right? Because remember, these unconscious associations occur just when two things are constantly associated with each other, and then it becomes unconscious. So how can we reduce the impact of these biases on our behaviors and our judgments and perceptions? If I don't have time to talk about anything else, do the opposite of this. So what do I mean by this? When you are stressed and overloaded under time pressure and multitasking, your brain cannot interrupt itself, right? It is on autopilot. And it's when your brains are making decisions on autopilot that you are most likely to be impacted by unconscious bias. I'll just give you an example of my own. Uh, I have multiple, but I'll just talk one because it's short and I'm, uh, I, I wanna leave time for questions. So one of the issues that I have, I learned, is when I go shopping, right? Target, Lowe's, Home Depot. I'm not paying attention. I just want, I'm, you know, I'm in the store, I'm doing things quickly. And I have so often approached people who do not work there to ask them, right, where something is. That is me not paying attention, not getting more information, acting unconsciously and just making a quick judgment when I see someone based on what they're wearing, perhaps based on their race and their gender, that they work there versus being another customer. And so if I continue to do that, because I'm not slowing down, taking in more information, thinking more critically about what I am doing, I am culpable for doing that, for acting on my unconscious bias. So when you when you're making a discretionary decision, when the criteria are ambiguous, right? An example that we as lawyers know, what is reasonable, right? That is truly an ambiguous criteria where we are exercising discretion. Those are situations where our unconscious biases will fill in the missing pieces and lead us to decisions that might be different based on an individual's race or gender, and we won't know it. So interrupting our bias is the most important way to reduce the impact uh, of these biases on our behaviors and our judgments. Good intentions, not enough, even though it's important. Suppression and avoidance, by that I mean, it's a lemon tart situation, it's the don't ask song about kimchi, it's I don't see race, right? Of course you do, your brain does. And uh, there are studies that demonstrate that people pretend to be colorblind in terms of I don't see race because they think to see color is to be or to see race is to be racist. It's not. And if you're not paying attention to an individual's race, you won't be able to safeguard yourself from acting on your unconscious bias. And if you believe that you are objective, the studies demonstrate that you are more likely to be impacted by these biases because then you're not going to be careful. So I wanna open this up now uh, for questions. There's a lot of interventions that I could share with you, but the thing that they have in common is that they, and, and so you can come up with ways, right? To disrupt, disrupt the unconscious functioning of your brain. So I'll give you an example. It's the last one mentioned here, committing to specific evaluation criteria. Let's say you're gonna hire someone prior to bringing anyone into your office to interview them, you and your hiring committee, which should be diverse because then you bring different things to the table, determine what the criteria are that you will use to judge every candidate and what weight you will give to each of those criteria and debate it, um, you know, fight about the criteria. But once you have decided then rate the candidates based on those criteria. Because otherwise, what we do is we change the criteria or we change the weight we give to particular criteria to hire the person that we think is a good fit, the person that we like, the person that we get along with. But all of those things are impacted by unconscious bias and racial anxiety. Now, I'm not saying you might not revise the criteria. Of course you can, but the fact that you want to throw away 
the criteria that you have agreed upon before is a trigger for you to remind yourself that maybe you're acting on your unconscious biases or racial anxiety. So that is an example. Another that uh, uh, one firm did, one cloud computing company did is prior to any performance evals, they will send an email to all of their managers saying, remember that you your ratings of your employees might be impacted by implicit bias. Just being aware of that makes you more careful. And by being more careful, by gathering more info, you are less likely to be impacted by the unconscious biases that you have. When you're writing uh, letters of recommendation or reviewing other people's letters of recommendation, they that too, keep in mind the unconscious biases I've shared with you about recommendation letters. When you're hiring people, the more diverse the pool, two or more of diverse groups increases by 75%. Uh, the chances of hiring a female candidate, for instance. Gathering data is critically important because you're not aware of your unconscious bias. It's only by gathering data and looking at outcomes that you might realize that you were impacted by your unconscious biases. So are we culpable for having them? Again, you know my point of view. I think it's remarkable those who don't even have unconscious bias. I don't quite know how that could possibly happen <laughs> just given the ways in which we see and read the news and watch TV and live our lives in this society. So what we must do, I think, is put systems in place to safeguard us and our institutions and our systems from acting on our unconscious biases. So I'll leave it there. I know I went through the, the last part very quickly, but this should just be a taster. There's so many ways you can learn about um, these unconscious biases and I hope that this has intrigued you enough to want to learn more. So thank you so much and I don't know if people have any questions. I haven't been monitoring the chats but I am happy. Uh, this was, you, thank you, this was terrific. It was tremendously illuminating and, oh, and positive. There's, there's hope for us after all. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed having conversations about the, the this very topic with you, Jeff, from the very first moment we that, met. So. That's right. And I appreciate that very much about your perspective. Um, first of all, there are about 110 people here, 112 people here at the peak, which is a huge audience for us. The Second Harvest Food Bank is going to benefit tremendously from the generosity of our audience and the students and community at uh, Colorado College. Boy, I uh, I hope they know what good times are in store for them up, <laughs> Thank up, you. There, up, there, up there in Colorado. Let me start with one question, and then Jean's been monitoring the chat, turn it over to her. Is there something that you have written, or is you have a little bibliography of things that, um, you know, yes. for those of us who are not social scientists, and <laughs> maybe we have a conscious bias against statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, uh, yes, and I, I think the best, there's a great website that has a lot of materials and information uh, that goes deeper into some of the things I've talked about and more. It's called perception.org. So perception.org, you can find more probably than you ever want and links to articles and uh, more information. So that's what I would recommend to you. Thank you. Jean, I know you've been diligently monitoring the chat. Uh, it's too many people here for us just to open it up for people to speak out loud. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Jean, uh, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Richardson. That was wonderful. Uh, quite frankly, the thing in the chat that just made me chuckle was somebody had to leave because one of their children ate all the donuts and the older child was quite upset and she had to go mediate this. Um, <laughs> but there is my unconscious bias. I just said she. I have no idea if it was a man or a woman who did that anyway. Oh, but see? How yeah. great that you caught yourself. I do. I catch myself all the time writing an email saying she when I'm talking about someone's assistant when I have no idea whether they're assistant is she or he, right? Yeah, so now I'm super careful that that is exactly what we want to do, right? Is to catch ourselves. Isn't that funny that you caught yourself? That was well, funny, in, yeah, in, well, in right that, here. It's all recorded now for in, posterity. In, in that discussion of donuts, thank you for not sugarcoating your response. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
anyway, and then for, back to serious, of course, this topic is, is very serious, but, um, you know, there are several questions in the chat that kind of come down to culture, and uh, our audience here is quite international. Um, a lot of people from Nigeria, for example, yeah. and they've raised questions, well, the audience has raised questions about foreign sounding names to Americans or just different sounding names maybe would be the way to phrase it and how that would impact it. And do Great you question. see the same things in other places in America? Is this mostly a U.S. based issue? Such great questions. I'm glad that you, you raised it. So I'll answer the second one first. It is not just a U.S. based issue because it's about the way that our brains work, but it is culture specific. So the unconscious biases I've talked about with our U.S. focus is mostly black, white, right? Because that is the, the primary um, interaction that's been studied and the primary uh, issue that, that social psychologists have focused on. I can't tell you in your culture, in your country. So you mentioned Nigeria, for instance, right? I can't tell you because I'm unfamiliar with your culture what it is that the unconscious biases would be there. But you would know, you would be able to hypothesize because you know the hierarchy or this beautiful book called Cast that I highly recommend to all of you, Isabel Wilker Wilkerson's book, Cast. Um, what is the quote unquote caste system in your country? Who is the subordinated group and who is the group that's on top? And then your brain, you know that your brain will learn that by virtue of your culture. So it's not a US phenomena, it is a brain phenomena. And then when it comes to names that are different, I am unaware of, I'm, I'm now just gonna hypothesize, I'm thinking about, do I know of any studies involving <clears throat> names? Uh, I, I can't think of ones offhand, but it would not surprise me, just like the resume study that I, I talked to you about, where there are certain names that make us think one race and certain names that make us think another race. Names that aren't John, Jill, names that are different, our brains will make a decision, right? Because we categorize everything. And so depending on what the name is, of course, our brains are going to think a certain race a certain gender, even my name, Song, right? When people don't know me, what I find so interesting is, to me, it's obvious that Song is a female name, but it's not, it's not obvious, right? And it's my mom's Korean name. Uh, but when people know that I'm the dean, but they don't know me, or professor, and they don't know me, the letters often say Mr. And I chuckle every time, right? Because it's the same way that I wrote she when I was writing an email about someone's assistant. People, our unconscious brains think dean, professor, male, which is why they say mister. So I think that's a great question. And yes, our names matter. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from one of the attendees asking, so is the answer to be aware of your unconscious bias and to get to know more people who are different? Be aware, yes. Why be aware? Because it makes you slow down and be more intentional and careful, right? So the awareness part is be aware of when you might be acting on your unconscious bias or when you have in the exact way that I caught myself, Jean, you caught yourself, we have all done it. Being aware of it because then you'll catch yourself next time. So, so that's part of it. But awareness is not enough, right? Because I don't want it to be just on the individual to have to change this. What I want is it doesn't matter whether you have unconscious biases or whether you're a bigot, I don't care which. If we put systems in place that can help us get more information, remind us to do that. So it won't matter that we have these unconscious biases because we'll be checked by them. That to me, the systemic changes changes within our institution to me are the most important, but I'll end with what you say. Getting to know people who are different from us is also critically important because when we start broadening those that we think are like us and make them part of our in-group, we just have more positive interactions, 
right? We are less uncomfortable. We think you're smarter, better, funnier, right? And so the more people you know, and the more you think of them as being like you, it can reduce the negative parts of bias and increase the positive parts of the biases that we have. Sounds great. One of the, our, um, one of the attendees here from uh, Vienna, actually, she Wow. She, and I do know it's a she. Uh, she put in, in the chat, I have heard of a European study that might be of interest to you. Um, ah, yes. Kids named Kevin and David, et cetera, primarily English names, have a more difficult school time in comparison with kids with German names. See, oh, I love that. I'll, I'll look that up. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Exactly, right? So each that's why it's just not a U.S. phenomena, right? Each it'll it'll impact people differently. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'll I'll try to find that study. Great, great. There's a lot more questions here. Any thoughts or insights on how unconscious bias plays with AI regarding video images and the inequality of black suspects erroneously being identified? Whew. Huge topic. So I'll, I'll just mention a few things about AI and bias and then unconscious bias. So often we hear about AI bias. My answer to that is the system is not biased, right? It is the data that's being input into it that the system is highlighting the bias within the data. So you may have heard like of the Amazon uh, situation where Amazon was using an AI system to determine who to interview, right? It was reviewing resumes for tech jobs. And if you think about tech jobs, there was a bias in hiring, right? Mostly male versus female. And so when you look at the resumes of the people who currently hold those jobs and you feed those resumes into the system, what the system started to do was to downgrade any resume that had any connection to being female. So if you belong to a women's chess club, if you were female, it would downgrade it, not because AI was biased, but because it learned from the resumes that were input that the qualified, not qualified candidates, but the candidates who already hold those positions who were successful were men. That's the, so I think that when AI demonstrates some sort of bias in its output, that is a signal to us that there was some bias that already existed right? That's what it does to me. It's a signal that we have a problem. So for me, it's not, let's now bury it and fix it. Yes, let's fix it. But it's not about fixing the AI. It's about fixing our society, our culture. Um, and then when it comes to uh, the, the question of African Americans and facial recognition, for instance, right? That we, we know that the studies demonstrate that these systems are far worse at uh, being able to recognize black faces, especially black female faces than white faces, more errors. Uh, one of the reasons for this is when you train the machine using photos and you think about who the technologists are that train the machines, most of them happen to be white men. And so when they're thinking about photos to use, sometimes they use photos of their friends and of themselves, right? And so there's a bias, the system's really good at identifying certain faces and really bad at others. Uh, and so these are things that we also have to think about as we think about the use of AI. And I think it's fixable. I'm not you know, a negative AI person. It's just, we have to be aware. Do you, you have any thoughts? Yeah. Oh, one last question. We're, we're, well, we're, we're about at the time. Uh, we wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Let me just add a thought regarding how, how this relates to mediation because we have a lot of mediators on the line. Yes. The mediators are, I assume about as subject to implicit bias as everybody else in society. And the question is, what do we do as mediators to try to root out our implicit bias as we chaperone negotiations every day? My sense of it has always been that the place where implicit bias sneaks in for mediators is when we rely excessively on shuttle diplomacy mm -hmm. and make the mistake of negotiating for people rather than creating an environment where they can negotiate more effectively on behalf of themselves. So my sense is that the way for mediators to deal with implicit bias is to say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hijack the lawyer's role in this negotiation. I'm going to trust the lawyers who the clients have chosen 
to represent them to do the bulk of the negotiating themselves. And I, I'm going to maintain that distinction between creating an environment in which others can do the best work they can, which I think is good mediation, and hijacking the lawyers' roles and negotiating for them, which I think has unfortunately become kind of the standard issue and which, which I characterize as bad mediation. So just a thought there for, for mediators. Let's uh, wrap it up being respectful of people's time. Song, thank you so much. This thank was you. just off the charts. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Jean. Uh, Natalie, we're over $80,000. Uh, to our very generous audience, if you're in a position to contribute, Second Harvest Food Bank, shfb.org, or a food bank in your community or that's important to you. If you're comfortable notifying Natalie of the amount and destination of your contribution, we would be so happy to add it to our running total. It's a fabulous audience and song, you're a fabulous speaker. Thank you so much. I was honored to speak to this incredible group. And it, once again, thank you so much, Jeff. It's been such a pleasure. You're welcome thank on behalf you. of Jean and, and Natalie and, and, Natalie. and Dean Richardson, song. Uh, best to everybody, we are complete. <laughs> Thank you.